Before that, though, the natural history of the English Channel is explored and just a few of its secrets revealed. Stretching along the coast of South Devon is a freshwater world that owes its very origins to the sea, a place that contains a natural history unique to these shores. A lagoon known as Slapton Lee. is where the freshwater lagoon of Slapton Lee, which lies on the far side of these rocks, pours into the English Channel. But for one creature, this is the only entrance from the sea. It's now the last week of April. The moon is full and the tide is rising fast. Conditions are right for the annual invasion of young eels, and they're already here. Known at this stage as elvers, these tiny creatures are nearing the end of an incredible journey. Born in the Sargasso Sea on the far side of the Atlantic Ocean, their feat of navigation still remains one of the most impressive and mysterious in nature. Now hiding amongst the shingle, they're waiting for slack water at high tide. Only then can they make their way up through the culvert that leads to the calmer waters of the Lee. At the other end lies their last hurdle, a weir. For the final assault, they will wait for the cover of night. Taking advantage of the darkness and a spring tide at its full, the main mass of elvers makes its move. But this is no isolated event. All over Europe at this time of the year, rivers and streams are under siege by countless millions of wriggling elvers. Here at Slapton, they emerge from the foot of the fall, seeking out the flows of least resistance, struggling up through the algal growth, exploiting cracks and trickles. They're even capable of bypassing strong currents by making their way across wet ground. Dawn over Start Bay. At first light, some elbows can still be seen working their way up the weir. Those that did not manage to get into the lee will wait for their chance over the following nights. Daylight brings many dangers, not least from the drying rays of the sun. Any stragglers are likely to be easy pickings for predators. 
and elvers have many. Herons and kingfishers make the most of this seasonal bonus before the survivors escape into the muddy bottom of the lagoon. It's an ignominious end for an elver that has managed to travel so far. Yet there are many more than a kingfisher can consume. Today, Slapton Lee is managed as a nature reserve by a field centre. But the actual existence of the lagoon is dependent on the giant shingle ridge which spans the length of Start Bay. Created in the millennia following the last ice age, when sea levels worldwide were rising, shingle was progressively washed inshore from far out in the channel. A road now helps to stabilise the ridge, and streams flowing from the land keep the waters of the lagoon fresh. A rich community of plants has developed along its length and a dense belt of reeds fringes the shallow margins. Crossing back over the shingle ridge, the fragile nature of its seaward side is revealed with a full force of channel storms is met, reinforced by boulders. But even here, many plants survive on its frontier. Buzzards can be seen most months of the year in this part of the country. Here, it's the grebes that signal the start of spring. The great crested grebe reaches the western edge of its range in Devon. Up to five pairs are known to breed. They begin by establishing territory. and courting a mate involves one of the bird world's most ritualistic displays. Longer days and warmer winds find the biggest breeding bird in Britain already on her nest. The mute swan builds a huge pile of plant material in which to lay up to seven large eggs. And once the clutch is complete, constant attention will be required for the five weeks of incubation that lie ahead. The growing intensity of the sun, heating the shallows, brings fish in huge shoals. But they're not the only creatures to enjoy the gift of warmth. The grass snake, like all reptiles, basks to raise the temperature of its body. Only active when warm, it hibernates during winter to emerge lean and hungry in spring. Harmless enough to us, lacking a poisonous bite, it uses its forked tongue only to scent danger or possible prey.
grass snakes swim well and do so regularly to catch small fish. Although frogs and newts also feature as favoured prey, small birds are unlikely to be taken. Coots are among the most aggressive waterfowl, especially when their young are just hatching. It's the most vulnerable time for a chick. Young coots recover quickly and are active and dry within a few hours. But it's at this stage that the chicks best exhibit a primitive feature of birds, a claw on each wing. While the older siblings wait for the return of an adult, the effort of hatching takes its toll, leaving the youngster weak and helpless at first. Within three or four days, the brood will leave the nest to follow their parents and find food. At night, they will return to a series of temporary platforms hidden amongst the reeds. Until then, young coots are at risk, easily falling prey to a predator. The North American mink, originally bred for its fur, now lives here all too successfully in the wild. But coot are not its only victims. Moorhen also suffer heavy losses at times. They too produce precocious young, able to swim and feed within a few hours of hatching. The female moorhen also makes good use of her resources, recycling her eggshells, a vital source of calcium. and it pays for parent birds to be attentive, less opportunity for the mink. Slapton Lee contains the largest area of fresh water to be found along the Channel coast. And from the village of Tor Cross, through the haze of early summer, the Shingle Ridge bursts into life. Here, only certain plants can endure the arid nature of the windswept shore. parasitic broom rape, bird's foot trefoil and white sea campion are among the first to flower. Just a stone's throw distance from the shore, back in the wetland crowded with reed, the rigours of a pending drought seem far away. Here, the wind-rustled realm is the world of the warbler. The most common and aptly named is the reed warbler. A summer visitor, wintering in Africa, the reed warbler comes to Britain to breed. And feeding on the prolific insect life of the nature reserve, they can usually raise up to five young. It's a busy time, demanding the constant attention of both parents for 12 days before their offspring can fly. Reed warblers hide their nests well. They need to, as they're one of the favourite victims of the cuckoo. That danger also applies to the sedge warbler, which conceals its nest in even deeper cover, low to the ground. This youngster is the last of the brood left in the nest. 
The others have already gone, scattered safely among the reeds. Normally raising a family of up to six, sedge warblers can sometimes rear two broods in a single season. But they don't need to forage far to find food. Indeed, reed beds are so rich in insects that the average sized territory of a warbler is not much larger than a tennis court. and it won't be long before the last of the family leaves the nest. Daybreak, a midsummer brings new life to the lagoon. It can take many hours before a dragonfly, freshly emerged, is dry and hard enough to fly, and a few days before they gain their full colours. Born to the wind and water, a damselfly takes to the air as the grebe to the lagoon. For several weeks, there has been little or no rain, and the water level has dropped, exposing more muddy margin than gravel shore. In the shallows, fish now gather in even greater shoals. But it has not always been so. Only in recent years have the fish appeared again in any number. Before that, there was a marked decline. It was as if the delicate balance of aquatic life was being upset, and it was. From the surrounding farmland came fertilisers, washed down by the rain, adding higher levels of nitrates than in the past. In addition, phosphates are coming from a different source. Although the sewage treatment is working as it should, the clear water running into the lagoon could just be adding to its problems. Water quality is constantly monitored by the educational activities of the Field Study Centre. The results help to assess any changes and indicate that some plant life here is far more lush than in other lakes, perhaps at the expense of water weeds and ultimately fish. The study benefits both the nature reserve and farmers who are losing valuable fertilisers into the lagoon. In recent years, the fish may also have gained from the removal of a large number of eels, which are known to consume the eggs and young of other fish. Unfortunately for fish, big shoals of roach and rudd attract attention. Today, the number of fish seems once again to be increasing. Massing in the warmest water, keeping to their own kind, they appear to be sorted by size. The smallest ones venture closest to the shore.
but such is the size of the shoals that even the gluttony of a heron makes little impression on them. Herons, however, can take much larger prey than the tiny kingfisher, which is limited to taking finger-sized fish or smaller. As summer blooms on the surface, the hidden strength of the lagoon lies below. Sunlight is vital to the process that fuels its life. A food chain where the laws of the jungle are maintained and the smallest falls prey to the biggest. At Slapton, no fish comes larger than the sinister streamlined shape of the pike. A mature pike will grow to a metre or more in length and can weigh over 30 kilograms. It's capable of catching and eating prey up to half its own size and will snatch young water birds as well as taking fish. Plants mark the passage of the seasons, whether rooted in water or out on the ridge, where the bugloss flowers. Here the baking sun sucks the shingle dry and a sea breeze brings salt spray. Fighting to survive, many plants have special features. Deep tap roots or the thick fleshy leaves of spurge. It's a fragile place, vulnerable to damage, which threatens not only flowers but the future of the lagoon. But death and destruction are no strangers to Slapton Sands. This tank is a poignant reminder of the hundreds of American soldiers that died here while training during the Second World War. Away from the battleground of the past, inland lies a peaceful place where people are encouraged to enjoy the natural surroundings and watch the wildlife. Making the most of the seasonal glut of insects, a reed warbler is followed by the family in a never-ending search for more meals. Not all of the nature reserve is open to the public. Beyond the bridge lies a secret world that remains largely untouched, a swamp where even the main channel is being engulfed by reeds. A wilderness of hidden pools and overwhelming growth that is home to one of the most elusive creatures of the countryside, the otter. Well known for their playful antics, otters are incredibly shy of human activity and so seek the sanctuary of the most undisturbed waterways. Slapton offers a haven to the otter. Dense vegetation provides plenty of places to hide and there's a rich supply of eels and other fish on which to feed. And that's important. Indeed, research carried out here has shown that there is little competition between otters and the closely related mink. Although part of their diet is the same, fish were found to be three times more important to the otter than to its alien cousin. But while mink have spread throughout the country, the otter is still sadly on the decline. Home is a hideaway 
deep in the reed bed or hidden under the roots of a waterside tree. Once widespread across Britain, hunted in the past and killed by chemical contamination, its population is now fragmented and pathetically small. Extinct from most of South and Central England, only in the more remote parts of Britain do they survive, and the West Country remains one of its strongholds. The passing of summer is marked by assembling swallows, replenishing their food reserves ready for the long journey south. Water levels are now low after the drought, and a change in the weather heralds welcome rain. Pure, sweet, fresh water, the lifeblood that is the lagoon, is renewed once more. Winter brings in the wildfowl. When compared with the rest of Europe, Slapton has a mild climate where frosts seldom last long. And that's to the benefit of the birds that come to pass the coldest months of the year. There are also winter highlights for the bird watchers. Rare bearded tits are usually regular visitors. But the most spectacular arrival takes place in late afternoon. Each winter, vast flocks of starlings migrate from northern Europe to swell the population of our resident British birds. Gregarious, they feed in flocks by day and roost together at night. And the reed beds at Slapton are one of their favoured sites. In time, the season will turn and the starlings depart. Nothing in nature is constant. In the long term, even lakes are temporary features. Their fate to become swamp and finally dry ground. Slapton's pure lagoon is no exception unless it is first reclaimed by the salt waters of the channel. Only with continuing care and commitment. Poland clean up at the awards and it's not the nine o'clock news.